Okay. All right. Looks like it has started. Okay. I don't see. That yeah. There they are. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? And can you hear me? I think it's. Can yeah. Okay. People okay. can hear you. Okay, very good. Uh, so welcome everyone to the cognitive science uh, session. My name is Raj Singh. I'm a professor of cognitive science and I've, uh, it's my pleasure to have Justine Kennis here, uh, who is uh, a student in our program. Uh, and I also had you in one of my classes. I was very yes. fortunate to have you in one of my classes. So that's, uh, and so we are here basically to share some information about cognitive science as a discipline about our particular program and uh, we're here to answer questions uh, that you may have um so you can use the chat if questions come up as i'm speaking and uh either justine or uh, ashley who's the host of this session will respond as we go along and if there's anything that needs to be addressed at the end we'll do that then Okay, uh, so uh, I, a lot of you are, I assume you're sitting there pondering what cognitive science is and whether to pursue a degree in cognitive science. And let me try to, let me try to spend a little bit of time just sort of highlighting some aspects of the, the discipline. And, you know, it's, it's one of these disciplines that's both, that's, you know, they're, it's 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 kind of a newish discipline it doesn't fit neatly into you know traditional categories and that makes it both kind of exciting on the one hand because it allows you to explore lots of things from different angles but it also makes it uh a challenge to explain maybe what exactly we do and what it is especially coming out of high school so very broadly speaking you know we we can think about we can think about the cognitive sciences the cognitive science discipline, our task, is if we imagine ourselves as a Martian, okay, and we land on planet Earth and you, you know, you're kind of exploring and you want to see what's on this planet. And you see there are rocks and there's water and there's, you know, there are cows and there are sheep and, you know, they all kind of do what they do. And it's all fairly mundane uh in the sense that you know once you kind of see how the thing works once you've got it you see it at time t it'll be the same thing 100 years later rocks haven't changed very much but something remarkable happens with the human so when you encounter a human you know they're pushed out into the world at some point and they do nothing but poop and cry and sit there and look cute and then, but they're exposed to all this information, right? They're exposed to a bunch of what we might nowadays call uh, data. And there's, so there's all kinds of information out there and the child absorbs this information and turns it into knowledge and action such that not too many years after they're, all they're doing is pooping and crying and looking cute, suddenly they're talking they're singing, they're making music, they're playing sports, they're coming up with all sorts of ideas about how the world works, about how, uh, you know, you know, even with my four-year-old, the other night we were kind of counting sheep in bed and he asked me, basically he understood that the number system is infinite. So we were kind of counting sheep or whatever we were doing and he goes, Papa, if we keep counting, will we keep counting the whole night? Like, will it just kind of go? Like, and he kind of understood that actually there's no biggest number. Because if you think you found it, you can always add one to it, right? And no other species has this ability to make this kind of infinite use of finite means, right? We have a tiny little brain, you know, smushed into our head. And out of that, we get for example, infinite numbers. We have an infinite number of thoughts that you can express, right? Infinite number of sentences. So again, you can kind of imagine, you know, the difference between a cow and a human, right? There's a certain number of things that a cow can say, certain number of things that, that crows can talk about. You know, here's a predator, here's a prey, 
here's my baby, whatever. But with humans, there's actually no bound, right? It actually, we're capable of infinite expression. And one way to convince yourselves of this, right, is to see that, imagine we did this following experiment. Suppose we said, look, I have a degree in cognitive science and I know all the thoughts that a human can have, okay? And I went to Staples and I bought all the paper in the universe, okay? And I'm gonna write down each sentence and each thought on a piece of paper. And you extend this from here to the Neptune, okay? And you think there, there's all the thought that humanity can possess. And then someone clever can come along and say, okay, well, if you take all of those sentences and conjoin them with and, that's a new thought. And that's a new sentence. So then you say, oh, sorry, I missed that one. Let me add that to the list. And then someone else can come along and say, well, here's a new thought. I think that that last thought is false. Right? And you, okay, you say, oh, that's a new thought. So I'll add that one. And you can see that this game actually never ends, right? You can just keep going. So that's the human species, right? Kind of remarkable. And remember, it, it's the only species on the planet that has this capacity. There's also many other things to our mind that are that are really remarkable. I'll just share a few things with you here. But so, for example, you know, I talked about data. We encounter a bunch of information, and then we try to make sense of it one way or the other. We're constantly doing that. So uh you can suppose i told you that there's some computer and it's spitting out i give you access to the numbers that it spits out it has some program in it and whenever it's done computing it just spits out a symbol okay so here's the symbol here's the sequence that it spits out one at a time first it spits out zero then it spits out one zero then one zero one Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And now you're sitting there waiting for the next symbol. What would you think? What would you predict? Somebody want to take a stab at what that symbol would be? There's no, you're not being tested. It's okay. If one. Okay. Bilal, thank you. Right. Everybody would say one. Right? That's the most sensible answer. And what's interesting about this is that, you know, is that you're, you feel like that's the only reasonable answer. But we know that in theory, it could be all kinds of things. You know, there could have been a zero. It could have been an X. It could have been a question mark. It could have been all kinds of things, right? Uh, but somehow you see some symbols, you see some data, and then your mind is like, ah, what's the pattern here? How do I make sense of this? And, you know, we're doing this again constantly, right? This is kind of a a, a, a certain kind of, co you know, contrived example. But this is also lies behind our scientific innovation, right? You, I have this pen here and I'm going to, if I let it go out of my hand, you know, it falls and you say, okay, you can be uninterested in that fact but as soon as you're interested in why does it fall why doesn't it just hover or why not shoot up to the moon or why not just twist on its axis or something like that and then once you start asking these things you start to get things like theories of gravity and all kinds of you know weird things that now we'd study in physics quantum mechanics and relativity and the whole business right but all of that is again you see some data you try to make sense of it this also comes up in interpersonal affairs. So those of you who are interested in maybe things like applied psychology or relationship management, you know, how many of you have been in a conflict where you hear something like, well, if you loved me, you wouldn't have said that. So what happens is somebody says something and you take that as evidence for them loving you or not loving you, right? Or, you know, I'm at your house for dinner and you say, you know, I'm over at your house and I say, look, it's kind of cold in here. You got up and you closed the window because you, I didn't say close the window, but you kind of understand that I'm basically asking you to do that, even though I didn't say it. Right? So we're constantly just, here's a bunch of data. Here's a bunch of information I've received. What does this mean? information mean? What's deeper? That's again, that's 
kind of quite a remarkable feature of of our of our mind right then our attempts to you've probably heard a lot about things like machine learning or deep learning you know we're trying to also create machines that can make interesting inferences like that but it's no easy task uh connected to that is also we innovate you know a uh, cow conversation from 400 years ago is probably not very different than what cows talk about now but humans have just are just constantly innovating right like this kind of thing wasn't around very long ago right um uh, 20 years ago we were dancing to 30 uh, God, how old am I? 30 years ago, we were dancing to Michael Jackson. Nowadays, we're dancing to Katy Perry, or maybe that's old news too. I don't know. But, uh, you know, our music keeps changing. You know, there was a Beethoven and now there isn't a Beethoven. You know, there's constant innovation on music, literature, even just uh, basic things like athletics. You know, not everybody used to, you know, before Wayne Gretzky came along, you know, he really there was a certain style of hockey and Gretzky suddenly created a new one, you know, wasn't very big, wasn't very fast, didn't shoot very well, was the best player on the, on the ice. Right. So we're constantly innovating and, you know, these are, these are just a few of this, the capacities that our mind is endowed with and is uniquely endowed with on the planet. That's so it's, but at the same time, we are part of an evolutionary chain. So it's got to be connected to things that are in the chimpanzee mind and the elephant mind and things like that. And so, you know, at the, on the one hand, one wants some kind of con continuity, a way to understand the mind naturally with as a biological thing. And so there's got to be similarities with other animals, but also something very unique about our cognitive capacities. And so all of this is is uh, is part of what we study in in the cognitive sciences is that we try to uncover these capacities that the mind is endowed with, uh, try to articulate a way that these things can reasonably be grounded in neuroscience. Right. It's because this what looks like magic isn't magic. Right. It's again, it's part of the universe. It's part of the physical matter that is in the universe. So this mental phenomenon must come from somewhere. Uh, but it's not clear why, you know, a, a brain that, you know, could be like a piece like a like a chocolate chip cookie that my daughter made last night. Not very different from this, but is obviously remarkably different from that. Right. So what is so different about the mind? Uh, how do we get, how do we build computational systems that can be intelligent? What does it mean to know that you've come upon an intelligent system? So is, is Google, is Google search intelligent? You know, it's obviously very useful, uh, but does it, is it actual intelligence? And, uh, you know, when you, you talk to these digital assistants like Alexa and Google and so on, they're pretty remarkable on the one hand because they kind of sort of more or less talk to you. You know, I go to my Google Nest and I tell it to play some song that I like and it does it. It's kind of pretty cool. But also, you can also crash these systems pretty quickly. So I don't know if any of you have... Uh, Google open now, or you have access to Alexa or one of your assistants, but you can ask, so suppose you do the following Google search. Let's say everyone can do a Google search. Suppose you were to write in, so most of you probably don't know US geography as well as you know Canadian geography. Let's do a US geography example. You ask, which states does, uh, which states border Texas? Let's say we were to write that question down. Which states border Texas? Right. And if you do a Google search here, we can, I can do one here. Someone else want to do one and see what you tell me what you find. Do you find the answer on Google? We can do this together jointly. If, any, if anyone's feels like they've found the answer, feel free to type it in.
Yeah, Louisiana and Oklahoma can't come up. There are two more. There you go. All right. So we have uh, we have our four answers. Those are there are four states that border Texas, and these are those states. And you kind of think, oh wow, that's that's pretty cool. Like, you know, I asked a question and Google gave me an answer. But if you think about how you found the answer, Google didn't actually directly answer your question. It sort of gave you some pages in which you could scan and find an answer, right? Uh, and you can tell that it doesn't truly answer your question by just asking a slightly different question. I'll type it in here, which states don't border Texas. So suppose you ask Google this. You can type it in as a little experiment now. And what you will find is that you get basically, you don't get the answer. You get basically the same thing as when you asked which states border Texas. Because it's just kind of looking at the words and it's kind of trying to find you uh, something that it thinks you're asking. It's trying to find you things that are relevant. All right. So it looks at the words and it kind of makes a guess about what you, it, you could be looking for. And it kind of is looking at states, border, Texas. Okay. Uh, but that's not what the question means. And you can see, you can ask two very different questions and Google kind of returns the same, basically the same answer, which means it doesn't understand, right? So us as cognitive scientists, we see this and we're all over this, okay? We're thinking, okay, so what do we need to do? First of all, what is this thing called language understanding that we have that the machine is lacking? And if we can be clever enough to, to articulate that, how do we put this knowledge into a system so that we can actually make these artificial devices useful to us? And you can imagine being in a surgical procedure uh, and you want to tell the machine exactly what to do and the thing has to understand, uh, that could be very valuable. Or you're sending someone miners down and you're, you're, you, you don't want to send a person into a dangerous mine, let's say, so you'd like to be able to talk to a robot. Well, then it should be able to understand, right? Yeah. Uh, and all sorts of potential applications, right? Um, so these are uh, some of the, the kinds of topics that cognitive scientists think about and try to understand. And I, you know, this is, again, this is just a very short, just a very brief window into this world. I mean, there's tons of, tons of things, you know, how does a child develop you know, and how do we, for example, if we understand how a child's mind works at the age of seven, we can better design pedagog you know, our pedag like our schools to design curricula that that are suitable for a seven year old as opposed to just something that an administrator decides, right? And uh, all sorts of applications like this, right? It's and so. This is just a little bit about cognitive science. I'll stop there because we don't have so much time. I'll stop about that, about the talking about the discipline itself. And I'm happy to, to take questions later. Okay, let me just say a little bit uh, about the program. Uh, so I think we have a really exciting group of students and a very excellent program. We have very dedicated faculty who are, and you know, we're quite unique in Canada in having a standalone cognitive science department. Uh, uh, we take, you know, we have connections to sort of the traditional disciplines like psychology, computer science, linguistics, neuroscience, and philosophy. Uh, and our students take courses in all these disciplines. And then they also pick one of these areas as a specialization, okay? So uh, you you get this kind of uh, breadth by studying several different disciplines uh, within our program. Uh, there's a common core of courses that all CogSci students take, and then you get to kind of specialize in a particular discipline so that you, you're not just a jack of all trades, 
and you're also not narrowly specialized. You kind of get the best of both worlds. You get a lot of breadth, but you also get focus, right? And so we try to strike that balance so that somebody, let's say, who's interested in computer science can do the cognition and computation stream, follow computer science very uh, uh, closely, but also get the breadth of the cognitive science perspective, right? And so on for the other disciplines. Uh, our students are really energetic and dedicated and fantastic. It's always a pleasure to see what they come up with. You know, our classes are designed to get a lot of uh, uh, face time with students and to get them kind of working on stuff, working on projects, doing writing. There's there's some coding. And there's at least one pro computer science class that everyone has to take. Uh, and for those that specialize, they can do more. Uh, we do lab work, we do writing assignments. We really try to get our students involved in projects and things like that from the get-go. Uh, those that are pursuing the honors stream, uh, one of the options is to do an honors thesis, right? Where you do a kind of in-depth uh, study with under the tutelage of a faculty member. Uh, you know, we encourage group work. We encourage students to find their calling. Uh, we have a lot of connections to um, industry and government, right? So a lot of our students end up either going to grad school or getting jobs in, let's say, high tech or in healthcare or in, you know, uh, various branches of the government. Um, uh, so... You know, and we also have our own, you know, we have our own bachelor's degree. So we're not just a BA or a BSc, we're a bachelor of cognitive science. And I think that, again, it stands out on a resume or a CV, and that could be positive and negative, right? On the one hand, it makes you stand out and it makes the employer say, ah, oh, what's that? I'm curious to know more, but it can also be harder for people to understand. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but we do have our own program, our own degree and it's it's uh so we and the faculty are are very dedicated to the students and to making this uh a, a very worthwhile experience for the students um and for me it's a real honor to to have great colleagues and great students here um i don't know so how about i stop here i could go on and justine could probably tell you i can go on for a long time just blabbing so how about i stop here and see if there are any questions about cognitive science about the, the program about anything anything that you like While we wait for people to, maybe, you know, for questions, Justine, is there anything you'd like to add that I missed or that I, some perspective that, that you know, from the student end that I'm probably um, not going to do? I mean, I, I, can, I can certainly talk a bit. Bigger. I think you, you did a good job um, introducing the sort of questions that cognitive science just um, kind of address. Um, so, yeah. Um, so for my, but I guess I could talk a little bit. Oh, I see um, a question. <laughs> um, I recently got an offer from Cognitive Linguistic Stream. That's the that's the stream I'm on, and also Raj teaches more language stuff. Um, but I wanted to know, could I switch con specializations such as the CS or neuroscience, for example? Yes. So um, actually, I did that. I switched at one point. Um, originally, I was in the psychology concentration. Um, so I ended up. Um, in my second semester, I ended up switching. Um, so that's totally doable. Though the two that you mentioned, and two concentrations you mentioned, neuroscience and computer science, there are some courses that are recommended to take in first year. Um, it's just it's just like one or two courses. It's not a lot, and you can do them in any concentration. Uh, you know, I did a neuroscience co uh, course, even though it was not part of my concentration. You can do that. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it should be 
totally uh so that's totally doable i don't know that many people who end up sticking exactly to the <laughs> concentration they chose um so that is totally doable yeah it's it's doable and lots of people s switch you know streams um one thing i'd like to add as a bit of a cautionary note with computer mm -hmm. science yeah is that we have so the computer science stream so in our program in general we have a computer science requirement and uh all the streams except computer science can satisfy that requirement with there's a kind of an in-house computer science course that we've developed uh and we offer it to students who we offer it basically to anybody who wants it uh but it's a uh, it's a way for students who aren't familiar with programming and with uh, computer science to nevertheless get involved in programming and understand some of the basic concepts. And so it's really a, a, an in-house course uh, for that allows non-programmers to, to get their kind of hands dirty with programming and to learn it. Um, for those who are in the CS stream, there's a kind of a more advanced CS course that, that they should take. And so you can, if you look at the 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 um, course descriptions and the program descriptions, you'll see what which course I'm talking about. I think it's 1805, or I don't know something. Like it's, it's I forget it's the course. 2005. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So you should. Yeah. That's that's the only kind of cautionary note about. Yeah. This. That so there's yeah so that there is that and then neuro it's recommended that you take first year intro courses. Um, because then you're, you have some courses in second year that kind of build up on those. Um, but yeah, you could, um, but yeah, so I, I technically signed up to one of those courses, even though I didn't have to, um, in my first year. So it's, you could, you could do them as a linguistics person. And, uh, yeah. but if you, if you're considering neuroscience, it might be good to, to try it out, you know, and then see if you, if you like that. And if you switch, then you have those courses under your belt. Actually, I think also even the, I mean, something I might advise anyways, if if you're sort of comfortable with it and, and uh, is that even if you're in the linguistic stream, the kind of the computer science course within the computer science department uh, would might be a good option for you, partly because you are kind of thinking you may switch into CS but yeah. also uh it's very useful also it's quite you know a lot of the study of linguistics is i mean it's quite related to computer yeah. science I and mean, we it's study more algorithms and parsing yeah. and, you know it, it they're, they're they're quite well aligned so it might actually be a good match for you anyways yeah. right um See if there's feel free to and uh, oh. does the program have any electives or is it mainly filled with mandatory classes good question um so um yeah so you do have uh room for some electives so um the way that courses work at carlton is that a course that is one semester long is a half credit and a full year course is one credit and so in total in your degree you have place for uh, 4.5 credits of electives, which is nine semester length courses. Um, so yeah, you have, um, so you, but, but however, there's some programs because they're more specialized, some of those electives, um, they're kind of there to maybe ensure breath requirements, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So maybe like people in biology have to take a little bit of like other sciences and stuff like that because our program is so broad. We, you know, we cover the sciences, we cover the humanities, the social sciences. Uh, we don't have anything like that. So your electives are totally up to you. Um, so you could, um, a lot of people opt to do a minor uh, with those things that is to, in one of the other um, disciplines in cognitive science outside of their concentration. Uh, and you, or you could go completely off the wall. Um, it's totally uh, however you want. So uh, yeah, I know for myself, I know there's some people that uh, I do, a lot of people in linguistics, uh, they wanna go into speech language pathology. So they might use those uh, electives to learn American sign language. Uh, so 
yeah, um, so that's technically kind of related to their career path, but it's not, there's no overlap with the COGSA requirements at all. Um, so yeah, uh, it, so there are electives and you are free to do whatever you want with them. Um, could you add a double major or an unrelated minor? I heard there can be hard to do because of the specialization. So um, probably not a double major. I don't know anyone who double majors in cognitive science. And another thing, cognitive science just has a lot of requirements and you, you already do a lot of breath anyways. Um, really, you span quite a bit, um, but you can do an unrelated minor, as I said, right? So American Sign Language, um, that had no overlap at all. Uh, you could do business, you could do really anything. Most uh, most minors are four credits long. And so, and you're, you have room for 4.5 credits. So that's like, so yeah, so it's like what that plus a half, uh, like a, like a semester long course. So you can do that. Um, but yeah, you don't, but that's basically the only extra room you have is those 4.5 credits or nine courses, as far as I'm aware. Also, one option if you didn't do the the honors stream, mm, yeah, that's true. That might give you room also. So there's also yeah, a few, like the honors stream is like a twenty credit option, right? Typically, you would do that in four years, and uh, there's a not there's a fifteen credit option available too, and that might give you more flexibility in doing a a double major and something that's kind of unrelated. Uh, Ashley, do you want to? Is this is this a, this question about how you declare a double major? Is that is, is this a general question about double majors at Carleton? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So if you want to declare declare double majors, um, if you're actually a Carleton student already and you're looking to do this in like the progress of your degree you would submit an internal transfer through your Carlton Central account, and then that gets approved by the admissions office. If you're looking to do it before you enter Carlton, you would have to contact the admissions office at admissions at carlton.ca, and they would be able to add that to your degree um, before, if it's possible within the program. Thank you, Ashley. Are there other questions or comments? What, what type of careers? Yeah, um, I can. Uh, I don't. Obviously, there's a wide things you can do. Um, I, as a person who's just about to graduate, um, that is definitely a question that's been on my mind. Um, and there's a lot. Um, personally, I am kind of in the middle of finalizing a contract with Statistics Canada uh, right now. And uh, basically, I my job will be, it's within a communications team, but mainly what I'll be doing is contacting people, the general public and stuff to host usability testing sessions. Uh, so kind of um, ask, so basically having these little kind of interview sessions, asking people, uh, you know, to interact with a certain prototype of website, usually uh, it could be an app too. Um, and, you know, get feedback from that. Um, and then that's kind of used to, to kind of tweak things, make things more user friendly. Um, so yeah, anything to do, there's a whole field of like user experience, which is all about making things uh, like easy to use uh, for people um according to how their psychology works <laughs> um so and it's there's also that computer element right um so uh so knowing a bit how those that work too is, is is useful um so so that's kind of the direction i'm kind of going in um and then there's as i said speech language pathology as i, I know some people, my occupational therapy is another one uh, those two require uh some sort of additional training like a master's uh but yeah um if you do the computation one, do you have a ton of stuff in tech that you can do? Um, 
And then there's obviously academia. <laughs> I don't know if Rosh can think of anything else um, on top of the head. There's a lot. Yeah, there's really uh, quite a lot. I mean, I uh, some of my former students, I mean, one is uh, like so some people go off to grad school and like, so one of them is now actually a professor at MIT. Uh, we have people in uh, high tech. You know, one of my former students is a director of AI at RBC Labs. We have people, uh, StatsCan is a destination. Uh, uh, some, like uh, Justine said, you know, we have a lot of students going to speech language pathology. Uh, there's mental health is another uh, kind of applied area. Uh, high tech industry, uh, usability design. It's really like you kind of pick it. We have students kind of in it, you know, it's, it's quite broad. And, uh, but yeah, I would say, I would say a good chunk go off to, to a master's or a PhD and, uh, others go into, go into industry or government typically. And, and they, I think they're quite successful in landing, uh, interesting jobs interesting and usually well-paying jobs we've been uh, we've been quite good with that and you know partly uh part of the answer to your question is actually really it depends on the student what they come up with like uh there's a lot you can mold your cognitive science degree into right and so actually uh, the careers that our students get they often you know, they have quite a big say in creating that pathway for themselves uh, because they come up with kind of uh, interesting profiles. Right. So there's quite a lot of say that you yourself would have in terms of which kind of career you end up uh, landing in. And, you know, uh, the uh, it's hard to obviously predict what the future will look like right but we we're in a an economy that you know wants to continue investing in innovation and continue investing and in, for there's a lot of in, you know interest in for example in high tech in mental health in data analysis in you know the kinds of things that a cog side degree really kind of prepares you for and you know, the stuff about usability design, I mean, it's really everywhere. Like you think about, uh, you think about any device you encounter, there's real questions about, you know, there's a real competitive edge to be had if you can design it in a way that's really usable, whether it's a yeah. high No one wants to use, yeah, no one wants to use something that's horrible. Like, yeah. it's, it's, there's a lot of value in it. Um, but yeah, no, and there's also, I wanted to say that in, in for cognitive science is one of the programs at Carlton where you can do a co-op option, which is what I did. Um, so you have uh, the opportunity to do three work terms um, before you graduate to kind of figure out. So if you're unsure, uh, you have the opportunity to kind of explore that or even with outside of it, you know, during your summers, try different stuff. There's research internships if you want to go the research academia route. Um, so yeah, it doesn't even close any doors. And even if it's a degree that maybe people don't know a lot and knowing interviews, like you might say, oh, like what's cognitive science? People, people don't know, um, the fact that people don't know it, you can make it sound as good as you can because it's, it's in your, it's, it, it's in your control. Um, and not because they don't have any really preconceived notions about it. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I definitely think it sets me up and, I, I'm open to doing masters, but I definitely don't feel like I need it to get a, a good job that I like. Also, I guess one thing that's connected to that also is the fact that we're in Ottawa uh, makes makes this discipline a good discipline to be in if you're going to be in Ottawa because there's there's so many potential employers in Ottawa yeah. that are interested in cognitive science, right? So, uh, you know, even actually just last week, you know, one of my students was signing on to something with uh, the Department of Defense 
uh, some research contracts with the Department of Defense. You know, so there's all these government labs. There's the National Research yeah. Council. There's high tech industry. There's you know, and we're also very close to Toronto and Montreal. Uh, so some students actually end up working there, taking a job or internships in one of those cities, and kind of commute and you know get on the via rail or whatever, and you're there and back in no time. So I think uh, CogSci in Ottawa is a kind of a good partnership, good place to do it. <clears throat> Great. Any last minute questions? Okay, it sounds like uh, we've exhausted the <laughs> questions here. So, uh, feel free to be in touch later if you have any questions. You can find my email address at the Cogsci uh, department website. It's just raj.singh at yeah. ca. <laughs> and uh, I'm. Uh, I hope this was useful, and hope yeah. to see some of you in the fall. And thanks, Justine and Ashley, for all your help. And uh, I'll see you. See you. See you all. And best of luck, whatever you. Hope, yeah. Um. Yeah, I wish you luck in your university search. Um, and yeah, I won't be seeing you because I will be done my degree. But I hope uh, hope some of you will choose cognitive science because it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck. Yeah. Bye -bye. All right.